Okay, welcome back to AR on AR. I'm Adam Rose, and today we're going to be looking at the second part of the lessons learned during the recent Adventure Racing World Championships held in South Africa. On the subject of flat pedals, this is a contentious subject. Many people think you aren't a proper racer unless you use clipless pedals because they're supposed to be more efficient than using flat pedals. However, the evidence is still out and you can go and read countless uh, articles, watch YouTube videos and you'll see it is not done and dusted as a subject. Now in my team, three of us invested in flat pedals rather than clipless pedals and this was definitely advantageous. Why? Well, for example, any hiker bike section posed no issue because we were wearing trainers already. It also meant our logistics were simpler because we always knew we had the right pair of shoes with us. I know of at least one team that was affected by their logistics plan being upset because they were forced to skip a stage. Sometimes that'll happen. If weather conditions get too bad, the race director will say to you, look, you're not allowed to do the following stage. We're gonna ship you across, take you by bus or whatever to the next stage. And so that's important as well that you need to review your logistics plan. So by wearing one set of shoes throughout a race, you simplify, you simplify, you simplify. And also we have to remember that adventure racing is not like road racing. You know, some people say, well, look, if you wear clipless pedals, you can pull on the upstroke and therefore use more energy, more efficiency. We're not doing a time trial. We're talking about endurance here. Flat pedals also allow you to alter your foot position far more during a race than you would with clipless pedals regardless of the amount of floats that you might incorporate in clipless pedals. So varying your foot position, your, your hip position, your knee position, ankle position, means you're less likely to develop repetitive strain injuries. That is a real thing. An adventure race and an expedition length adventure race, the more you can adjust for aches and complaints and, and shift your, your, your position means you, you're going to take less wear and tear. Also in my case, I'm used to having numb toes from expedition length races. If you've done hike a bike in bike shoes for many, many miles, those shoes are not designed for you to hike in, so they're very, very stiff compared to regular trail running shoes. And I've, I've been a, just grown used to having numb toes for anything like six weeks, two months, three months after a race, can't feel my toes. Here I did the longest biking stages I've ever done. End of the race, not a single issue with my toes. So, uh, you know, there are many, many reasons, but flat pedals are not to be discounted, and there are teams increasingly who, who are seeing the wisdom in the simplicity and the versatility of just wearing trail runners throughout an expedition race. Now, this also applies to bar ends. If you haven't got a pair of bar ends, whether they sit on the outside of your handlebars, on the inside of your handlebars, they also help you to mitigate issues. So, you know, being able to vary your hand position, means you're less likely to get wrist issues. And to that end, I went for bar ends that were incorporated into the grip, the handlebar grip. Now the most common ones that look like the ones you can see on the screen here are made by somebody called Ergon. I didn't buy those. I just bought cheap imitations of Amazon. They cost me about 10 pounds and they work perfectly well for the whole race. For long races especially, lots of, uh, lots of riding, make sure you can vary your hand position and bar ends are a great way to do that. I know they don't look amazing. The appearance doesn't matter, of course. It's what helps you to race more effectively. Eat the elephant in small chunks. I'm referring to the fact that sometimes when you're faced with an expedition race, especially your first one, it can seem daunting. Like how on earth am I going to last the whole course? How on earth am I going to walk, run, hike, bike, kayak? Such an incredible distance. Focus on the here and now eat that elephant in small chunks. And that's exactly what we did. This was helped by the fact that we didn't have all the maps in one go. So all we could do was focus on the stage that was coming up. As Wayne Campbell says, live in the now. So by focusing on one stage at a time, we don't get overwhelmed with the, the mental challenge of just how long the course is going to be. If somebody had told me before it started that we were gonna do close to a thousand kilometers, I probably would have surrendered earlier on. You know, too much, too much. But uh, just by keeping our eyes focused on what was at hand, we were able to, inch by inch, cover the whole course. 
before the start of the race, we were given two transition boxes and they had a very, very strict weight limit of 25 kilograms each. And for a course that went on for up to nine days, you know, that's a very small amount of food you can put into those boxes in order to last the entire period. And many teams were complaining about this. But on the flip side, there was very good food at a lot of the transitions. So, you know, we were able to eat as much as we could every time we got into transition. And then teams were able to scrounge food en route. So, you know, sometimes maybe stopping in a small village or a small town, or even knocking on the door of a farmer and saying, please, have you got any food to sell us? Uh, teams may do. So, although the concerns beforehand, like how on earth are we going to manage with what is in essence per, per transition box, about four kilograms per person, because you have other equipment as well. Um, it didn't seem like eight kilograms of food was going to be sufficient for any individual, but it wasn't necessary. So, don't be intimidated by the length of a race. Eat the elephant in small bites and get some of that elephant from local sources. I wanted to talk about vitamins because they help to maintain your health. Now, I know a lot of people are skeptical about having vitamins in their day-to-day -day food. They say you should be getting enough nutrition from just what you normally eat. But in an adventure race, and especially an expedition length race, you're often eating junk food. So you want to get as many calories as possible. That might be very high sugar food, highly processed food. It's also in the form of powders. So you're not gonna get the nutritional balance that you really need. And that's compounded by the sleep deprivation and extreme stress your body goes through. You know, just the physical stress, let alone the mental stress, emotional stress of racing day in, day out, 24 hours a day. So I have vitamins that I set up before the race in little Ziploc bags. And in my food packs, which are normally something like six hours worth of calories or 12 hours worth of calories, amongst all the food in the larger Ziploc bag, I will have a small Ziploc bag of the vitamins. And they help me to fight inflammation, fight infection, uh, to contribute to tissue repair, and just general bodily health, stress, replacing B vitamins that are lost so quickly due to stress. And by keeping these in my system, making sure I'm getting enough, then, you know, I'm less likely to get sick, I'm less likely to suffer any issues, and my body will recover better during those brief periods of sleep that we managed to snatch. Don't discount vitamins. It's not a normal situation when you're racing. The race had the longest bike legs that I've ever done. In total, the three bike legs came to over 650 kilometers. Now, that's an awful lot of riding. In the first mountain bike stage, I didn't have any seat cover and I was carrying more water than I normally would because we'd been warned there wasn't much water out on the course and it's a, a dry, arid region. So we were recommended to carry a minimum of four liters of water at any time. Four liters is four kilograms. So although I had trained with a heavy pack, I hadn't trained for four kilograms worth of water. And when you, when you have that water on your back, in any sense, it's gonna to contribute to how much pressure there is on the saddle. So by the end of the first bike stage, my bum was sore. But I'd thought about this potentially happening and it had a gel seat cover in my bike box. So for the second bike stage, which was the longest at over 220 kilometers, and the third bike stage, the gel seat cover worked wonders to take the pressure off uh, various areas of my bum and make it a far more comfortable ride. And one of my teammates really wished he had had one. He also said to me, um, his training on the stationary bike at home really wasn't sufficient for bike stages of this length. So his advice was, in preparation for the next expedition race, he was gonna spend more time preparing on his bike out on the roads, up and down hills, which is going to acclimatize your bum to the pressure and the, the discomfort that you wouldn't find if you're just sitting on a turbo trainer in your house. One of the teams, Team Namakwa, uh, came up with an ingenious idea to take the weight off their shoulders when they were riding. As you can see here in these pictures, they used pool noodles zip tied onto the saddles so that when the backpack was on the shoulders, instead of the weight falling on the shoulders itself, it is supported by the pool noodle at the back. So it literally is like lifting up the back of the pack. I've never seen that solution before and I really like the idea, so I'm gonna give it a try. Um, but whatever you do, you know, you want to be able to mitigate issues that might arise from spending so much time in the saddle and too much pressure on your bum. A lot of people don't like it because they think your bum moves around too much and that might lead to friction. I didn't have any friction issues from having used that gel seat cover. In some races, when it comes to waterproofing your maps, uh, you might simply use a map bag, which I always have with me, 
or you could use adhesive plastic, also known as contact paper, to cover those maps so that, of course, they're not affected by rain or dirt or mud. In this race, we had 42 A3 pages per set of maps. If we'd used adhesive plastic, that would have taken not only a cost, but also a lot of time to waterproof the maps every time at the beginning of each stage. Instead, we used A3 Ziploc bags, and it was very, very effective. So that's a recommendation. In future, I'm only going to be using Ziploc bags rather than adhesive plastic or contact paper. And also, I would recommend taking not just one or two of these uh, Ziploc bags, take a whole uh, handful. We had about 25 with us when we came to the race, and we put them into the bike box, into the transition boxes. So if they got damaged or scuffed or covered with mud, in transition, we could just swap them out for a new set of Ziploc bags and, you know, fresh, clean, easy to read through, and it worked very effectively. So a great way to keep things waterproof, A3 or A4 Ziploc bags. Something I really missed in this race was bringing along a sleeping mat. In all my previous expedition races, I've managed to get away with just sleeping on the road, sleeping on the dirt, sleeping on the grass and things. But with literally over a week's worth of time out on that course, what I really wished I'd had was either a closed cell mat like this. This only weighs 245 grams. Or an inflatable one like this. This weighs uh, 350 grams. Either way, it would have contributed to the quality of the sleep that I had. But instead, I was lying on the floor and it's not comfortable. And as a consequence, the quality of sleep wasn't as good. Some people might say, well, look, that's extra weight. I think it would have paid dividends. Even if I'd had this in the transition box, that would have paid dividends. So it's not necessary that I would have necessarily carried it everywhere. But, you know, 245 grams, stick it on the outside of your pack, hardly, hardly discernible. And that way, sleeping in the riverbed, sleeping on the tarmac would have been a much more comfortable experience. So a great investment. I'm definitely going to include this in my uh, transition box at the very least in future. When it comes to mandatory kit items, don't simply take what is on the mandatory kit list. Sometimes it pays dividends to take more. Now, the weather on this event was worse than we expected. So, you know, on the second night when the storm hit and it became freezing, uh, we were caught out a little bit. Uh, the race hadn't required us to bring waterproof trousers. So one team member had, three of us had not. And, you know, in the squall coming down off the mountaintops, we weren't in the best position. And a lot of other teams fell into the same situation. I saw one team that had used uh, sacks that they scrounged from a farmer's barn and wrapped them around them, almost like a kilt, in order to keep the terrible weather at bay, you know. On the other hand, one of the other teams, Team Quest Stars, from the UK, used to inclement weather, had brought along pretty much the kit they would normally use in the UK. So when the bad weather hit, they told me it really didn't affect them. They could just continue. They were warm enough and dry enough that they could just push through those conditions. Now, before the race even starts, you should be consulting uh, weather forecasts to see what might happen. And we did that, but nobody expected uh, such a uh, freezing conditions to occur out in the course. Now, it's not simply cold weather that can be inclement. Of course, there can be the opposite extreme. And in this case, some teams reported uh, heat in excess of 42 degrees Celsius. And one of the stages, stage eight, involved crossing a valley floor from one mountain range to another. And we did that right throughout the day. And it was very difficult to find any sort of shade where, you know, there hardly any trees. It was kind of dry, arid desert conditions. One of my friends, Paul Taylor, found his team suffering from the extreme heat. So they decided to use their foil blankets, part of the mandatory kit, to protect themselves from the heat forming a temporary shelter when they couldn't find trees to rest under. I've never done that before and it was a great idea and it's part of the kind of adapt and improvise ethos that you should develop when you go expedition racing. And lastly, how do you complete an extremely long adventure race? You know, for some people that might only be a 30 hour race, for some people it might be, uh, you know, five days. In our case it was over eight days. Well, Common sense would say, take care of yourself, you know, make sure you're eating enough, drinking enough, uh, that you maintain a positive mental attitude. I would argue an expedition race, because you're in a team, it's actually better to focus on your teammates. If you've been on an airplane, you've no doubt heard a safety briefing, and usually they tell you, look after number one, 
when those oxygen masks fall from the ceiling, put it on yourself first before putting it on anybody else. While that is true for an aeroplane environment, on an adventure race, if you prioritize the well-being of your teammates, you're far more likely as a team to prevent problems becoming real issues that lead to the retirement of the team. So for example, maybe I'm not eating and drinking enough because I'm feeling ill, because I'm feeling down, because I'm too exhausted. If I'm only looking after my own needs, I might not notice the rest of my team is starting to suffer. My teammate needs help. My teammate needs encouragement. My teammate needs me to carry their pack for a period of time while they recover. If everybody in the team is prioritizing the needs of the rest of the team, that automatically means in a four-person team, each person is being looked after by three sets of eyes. Rather than each team member living in their own bubble, looking after their own needs, you know, if I'm, if I'm the only one looking after myself and I start going down, who's going to pull me out of it? So it might be a different approach for some of you and it'll help the team to gel together, to work together as a unit rather than as four independent people operating independent of each other. Just something to keep in mind. So that concludes the second episode on the lessons learned during the Adventure Racing World Championships. If there's anything you wish to add, drop it in the comments and maybe ideas for future episodes. All right, see you on the next one.